So last night was the uh, big interview, the big day, the big moment on CNN. Kamala Harris finally emerged from from hiding uh, with her emotional support dog, her golden retriever, Tim Tim Walls, and they sat down for an interview. Uh, It's the first time she's answered any questions since wrestling the nomination away from uh, the cucumber, who is technically still president right now. And as expected, the interview did not go well. Um, It didn't go well, and it kind of proved why she hadn't done any interviews until that point. And uh, and it also proves why, uh, strategically, they should have just stayed the course and not done any interviews. I mean, she could have gotten away, probably gotten away, with not just not doing any interviews until the election. She could have gotten away with it. And uh, and it was a tactical mistake to um, to sit down for this interview. Because the moment she sits down and starts speaking off cuff, off the cuff, it's just uh, this, this, the, 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 hype bubble that has been surrounding her for the last month is is punctured. Um, and that's what we saw. So uh, let's we'll start with this clip. This is the one that's probably gotten the most attention. And here she's asked by the anchor, Dana Bash, about all of the flip-flopping that she's done. And um, here is her excuse. How should voters look at some of the changes that you've made, uh, that you've explained some of here? Uh, in your policy, is it because you have more experience now and you've learned more about the information? Is it because you were running for president in a Democratic primary? And should they feel comfortable and confident that what you're saying now is going to be your policy moving forward? Dana, I think the, the, the most important and most significant aspect of my policy perspective and decisions is my values have not changed. You mentioned the Green New Deal. I have always believed, and I have worked on it, that the climate crisis is real, that it is an urgent matter to which we should apply metrics that include holding ourselves to deadlines around time. We did that with the Inflation Reduction Act. We have set goals for the United States of America and, by extension, the globe around when we should meet certain standards for reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, as an example. That value has not changed. Okay, so let's review all the problems with this, uh, or at least some of the major ones. First of all, Dana Bash gives her the, uh, the gives her the question with multiple choice answers. So she asks her about the flip flopping, and then feeds her a couple of possible answers that she might give. And one of them is, "Oh, is it uh, is it just that you've learned more, and your and your so your policy, you know, as, as you've grown and learned, you've changed your opinion." Um, and that's, you know, that's about as good ex- an excuse for flip-flopping as you're going to get. And so Kamala Harris could have said, well, yes, yeah, it's exactly that. You're, you're 100% right. That's it. Uh, listen, I've, I've, I've learned, I've grown, I've, uh, as I've gotten more information, I've changed, just, just like anyone, I've changed my view as I've gotten more information. Uh, she she could have said that, but, but she doesn't. Instead, Kamala doesn't take the hint, does not accept the gift that's been given to her, and she goes off on a ramble about how her values haven't changed. She won't deny that her policies have changed. She says her values haven't. So, um, well, then, then if your values haven't, then why, why have your policies changed? Are you admitting to being, being an opportunist and a hypocrite? Uh, is it, is it, like, isn't it better? It, it's one thing if your, if your policies have changed in the same direction, right? Maybe you're, you, you, were, you were liberal and they become more liberal. Well, then you can say, well, my values haven't changed. But when the policies flip, when it's the opposite of what it was before, and yet your values are exactly the same, well, all that tells us what you're admitting is that either before or now, you're full of it. You're, you're being an opportunist. You're being a hypocrite. Then she goes off on the climate crisis. She says, and, and I quote, I wrote this down. She says, it's an urgent matter to which we should apply metrics that include holding ourselves to deadlines around time. So this is more patented Kamala word salad. As always, she she continues to speak like an eighth grader, writing a book report and stretching to hit the word limit. You know, you got to get to two pages and and you're at uh, one and two thirds of a page. And so you just got to keep, it's too late to go back and use a bigger font or whatever. So um, so, uh, deadlines around time, she says. These are deadlines around, what else would the deadlines refer to? It's a deadline. It has to do with time, of course. You don't have to. We don't need you to specify that. What else would the deadlines be? Would they be deadlines around 
what, color, shape, uh, uh, smell? Yes, it's around time. You don't need to specify that. We know that, Kamala. But she just adds more words into her answer, keeps padding out the answer with words and more words. Uh, and not even like colorful or interesting or descriptive words, just, just words. So that she can talk without saying anything. And then to top it all off, she proceeds to admit, and again, she didn't need to. This was She wasn't backed into a corner. She didn't need to say this, but she proceeds to admit that the Inflation Reduction Act was actually a Trojan horse to push through her climate agenda. Um, talk about an unforced error. Now, anyone who's perceptive enough already knew that, but she didn't need to volunteer <laughs> that information. Uh, and yet she did, because she's just very bad at, at this. Um, then she was asked about flip-flopping again, this time around uh, the issue of fracking. Listen. And I made that clear on the debate stage in 2020, that I would not ban fracking. As vice president, I did not ban fracking. As president, I will not ban fracking. In 2019, I believe, uh, at a town hall, you said you were asked, would you commit to implementing a federal ban on fracking on your first day in office? And you said, there's no question I'm in favor of banning fracking. So yes. So it changed in, the, in that campaign? In 2020, I made very clear where I stand. We are in 2024, and I've not changed that position, nor will I going forward. I kept my word, and I will keep my word. What made you change that position at the time? Well, let's be clear. My values have not changed. I believe it is very important that we take seriously what we must do to guard against what is a clear crisis in terms of the climate. And to do that, we can do what we have accomplished thus far. The Inflation Reduction Act, what we have done to invest, by my calculation, over probably a trillion dollars over the next 10 years, investing in a clean energy economy, what we've already done, creating over 300,000 new clean energy jobs, that tells me. So apparently her advisors gave her this, my values have not changed line. So they went into it. They knew they knew she was going to be asked about the flip-flopping because she's changed her views on literally everything. Um, and uh, the only thing she's been consistent on is killing babies. That's the only issue that she's been consistent. She has been consistently in favor of that. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll give her that. She's been consistent on that issue. She's always cared deeply about killing babies. She wants to kill as many as she can. But um, everything else has changed, every other single thing. And, and so they knew this going in, obviously, and her advisors gave her, uh, my values have not changed. She keeps repeating it. And that's the one thing. If you give Kamala a line and, she, and it plays well or she thinks it plays well, she will repeat it over and over and over again, even in the same conversation. And uh, it, even though it's not, it's not a good line, it's, I mean, it's not hard to come up with some good lines to kind of distract from the fact that you're a flip-flopping phony. That's not a good one. That's a bad one. And yet, that's what they decided to have her do. And then she goes off on the climate again. And again, just quoting her, I believe it is very important that we take seriously what we must do to guard against what is a clear crisis in terms of the climate. What? Who speaks like that? that this is not human language. People don't talk like that. What you're trying to say, Kamala, is that we should take the climate crisis seriously. Now, never mind that there is no climate crisis, but... Uh, that's what you're trying to say. You're trying to say we should take the climate crisis seriously. So just say that. Just say those words. That's It's easy to say that. Why are you adding 14 extra words that are not needed? Um, and uh, and then there was a, also, the, we'll play one more from Kamala. She was asked uh, uh, about her failure on the border, and she tried to blame Trump for it. Let's hear that. As vice president, you were tasked with addressing the root causes of migration uh, in southern countries. and Northern that, part of Central America. The northern part of, of, yeah. of, uh, of Central America that deals with, that affects the southern border of the U.S. Mm -hmm. During the Biden-Harris administration, there were record numbers of illegal border crossings. Why did the Biden-Harris administration wait three and a half years to implement sweeping asylum restrictions? Well, first of all, uh, the root causes work that I did as vice president that I was asked to do by the president has actually resulted in a number of benefits, including historic investments by American businesses in that region. Um, the number of uh, immigrants coming from that region has actually reduced um, since we began that work. But I will say this, that Joe Biden and I and our administration 
worked with members of the United States Congress on an immigration uh, issue that is very significant to the American people and to our security, which is the border. Mm -hmm. And through bipartisan work, including some of the most conservative members of the United States Congress, a bill was crafted, which we supported, which I support. And Donald Trump got word of this bill that would have contributed to securing our border. And because he believes that it would not have helped him politically, he told his folks in Congress, don't put it forward. He killed the bill. So Trump, who isn't even in office right now, is responsible for her own failures to secure the border. Uh, Trump killed the bill when he's not even an elected official. That's what she's going with. And it's just one of, of, of many really bad excuses, poor excuses, poorly communicated. And if I had to sum up the interview, I'd sum it up that way. But no excuse offered during this interview was worse than this one from Tim Walls. So Tim mostly just sat there like a good puppy, quietly and obediently. Um, he did bark on command a few times when they offered him a, a treat. And uh, just just watch this moment when, he's, when, he's, when he is asked about, the, uh, about his stolen valor, about lying about his military record. And <laughs> I mean, it's, it truly is an amazing answer. It's, it's especially given that, keep in mind, he had to know that this question was going to be asked. And so you'd think you'd have something ready to go. And this is what he comes up with. I want to ask uh, you a question about how you've described your service in the National Guard. Mm. Uh, you said that you carried weapons in war, but you have never deployed actually in a war zone. A campaign official said that you misspoke. Did you? Well, first of all, I'm incredibly proud. I've done 24 years of wearing the uniform of this country. Equally proud of my service in a public school classroom, whether it's Congress or, uh, or the governor. Uh, my record speaks for itself, but I think uh, people are coming to get to know me. I, I speak like they do. Um, I speak candidly. I wear my emotions on my sleeves. And uh, I speak uh, especially passionately about, uh, about our children being shot in schools and around, around guns. So uh, I think people know me. They know who I am. They know where, uh, where my heart is. And again, my record has been out there for over 40 years to, to speak for itself. And the, the idea that you said that you were in war, yeah. did you misspeak as the campaign has said? Yeah, I said we were talking about, in this case, this was after a school shooting, the ideas of carrying these weapons of war. And uh, my wife, the English teacher, told my grammar is not always correct. But again, if it's not this, it's an attack on my children for showing love for me or it's an attack on my dog. Okay, like it, it really is an incredible answer. I, I mean, for, for two incredible answers, because first he's asked, hey, why did you lie about your military record? And his first answer is, well, you know, I'm opposed to children being shot. Yet, as are we all, Governor, but what the hell does that have to do with you lying about your military record? And then his second answer is that his grammar, he has poor grammar. Oh, shucks, you know, listen, I'm just a normal, everyday guy. I wear blue jeans and sneakers. I mow my lawn, okay? I, I eat fast food. I go to Walmart. And, you know, sometimes we regular old everyday folk, we mix up our words and we use bad grammar. And sometimes our grammar is so bad that we accidentally lie about our military record for 20 years. Uh, I'll tell you what, Donald Trump, he's, a, he's such an elitist that he's never pretended to have combat experience. That's what an elitist he is. That's what we're going with, bad grammar. Don't you hate it when, when, when your grammar is so bad that it causes you, to, causes you to invent whole periods of your life that never occurred? Yeah, I mean, one time I, you know, my grammar was so bad that I accidentally claimed that I was the deposed king of Cambodia. Uh, that's how bad my grammar was one time. It was just really, really bad grammar. Really bad. Silly me. Uh, so that's, that's what they're going with. It, there is one other thing I wanted to mention. Uh, so we've talked about the content of the of the, the interview and such as it is, and that, that's it. I mean, that's that's what it was. And as I said, it kind of goes to show why uh, they really shouldn't have done. I, I mean, yes, they should do. Like from the from a perspective of just basic integrity, they should do interviews and talk to the American public because they they want to be in, in the White House. Um. But politically, strategically, they should not have done it. And I think this is maybe one of the smartest, best things that uh, the Trump camp 
has done during this election cycle, at least certainly since Kamala came on board, was to bait her into doing an interview. Um, it's really pressure. It, it, it's really entirely pressure from, that's what's so amazing about it. There was very little pressure from the left for her to do an interview because everybody on the left knows. They didn't, they didn't want her to do it because they knew it was going to go like this. Um, so it was all pressure from the right. You know, it was the Trump camp. It was just, it's like people like me, just, you know, just conservative people with platforms. We're all the ones saying, hey, why isn't she out there doing interviews? She should really, it's like, we obviously want you to do it because we know it's going to be terrible for you. That's why we want it. I mean, look, this is, you know, and they, and they, and they succumbed to the pressure and they put her out there and it was terrible, um, which is great. So that's the content of it. But there's one other thing that I've just been, I, 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 it doesn't matter that much, but I'm, um, maybe it's the media member in me. It's like, it's like the, the fact that I'm in media and I'm on camera uh, that makes me, well, can we pull up the picture, just pull up the screenshot of this, of the interview so we can look at the, okay. What is going on? What, what is this? What kind of set? Why are they, Why? Why are they doing, why does it look like that is my question. That's what I want to know. What kind of set did they choose for this conversation? Because to me, it looks, I guess you can see it kind of says cafe in the background, but just first, first impressions when you look at it, to me, it looks like an empty airport bar at some kind of regional airport somewhere. The, they look like depressed travelers coming home from uh, a business conference at a at a, a Hilton somewhere in Cleveland, and it just it's like a very weird melancholy kind of vibe to it, and it's the lighting. It's, why is it so dark? Why is the lighting so dark? Why are there empty cups in the shot? Who that was deliberately put there? That's not naturally there. So they for some reason they chose this cafe. They made it very dark. Uh, they're going for that vibe. And they looked at the shot and somebody, I don't know if it's someone at CNN or someone in the, the Kamala campaign, not that there's any distinction. Someone looked at the shot and said, you know what, wait a second. You know what we need? We need a bunch of empty cup, cups in the background. We need about, well, we're, we're no, no more cups. No, not one or two. We need, we need 10 cups. Put 10 empty cups in the shot. We need all the empty cups we can get for this thing. Okay, we need the cups. There's, there's not more cups. We need more cups. It doesn't make any sense. I don't get it. And they're all, why are they dressed in colors that match the furniture? He, he is dressed in the same color as the seat. So he blends in. Looks like he doesn't have a body. Just like this big lumbering head floating, suspended in space. And then Kamala's dressed to match the table. So I, was that a, a plan? They said, we, we got to match the furniture. And she's also, look how short she, why is she so small compared to the other two? She looks like she's three feet tall. Like get, you get her a higher seat so that she doesn't look like a child. I mean, it's just bizarre. I don't, I don't get it. The whole, the whole thing is weird. I, I don't, that's, that's what I want to know. This, this, uh, forget about the content of it. I want to know why they set up the shot like that. Because um, it makes me sad. Actually, like it makes me sad that these people are running for president, but but just the 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 look of it, it, get, it kind of makes you sad. It has a sad kind of feel to it. If you'd like to see what else I have to say, you can access my full show by going to dailywire.com or by going to the Matt Walsh Show Twitter page. Hope to see you there. Godspeed.